Welcome to the Soul Script Podcast. Here we explore how to unlock the power of our story. Our journey here on Earth can be one of deep passion, intentional creation, and personal transformation. The only thing holding us back is our stories. Come and join me as we rewrite and reignite. You're going to have to forgive me if I'm a tiny bit somber today during this conversation because the things that I'm going to talk about are pretty intense, very vulnerable. And I keep saying every time I get on to film this podcast, I'm like, this is the one that I'm most vulnerable in. No, this one's the one that I'm most vulnerable in. And in truth, I'm vulnerable in all of them because I really value showing that authenticity authentic side of me and really trying to express myself and the darkness that's inside of myself and the happy things that are part of me because all of those make up who we are. It's not just our light, but it's also our darkness. And honestly, addressing my darkness has been one of the most valuable tools for me. So I'm going to share with you some maybe somewhat intense stories, at least they're intense for me to be able to share with you today. And they are all somewhat somber, but so valuable in my life journey. They're ones that I can look back on and really see that they have added to who I am today. We're going to continue with our journey of exploring intuition because that's what we've been talking about. We're going to take it a level deeper. And this level deeper is exploring the things that block us from being able to use our intuition. We can practice intuition all day, but there are definitely things that are going to show up for you that block you from being able to have perspective and that give you biases that prevent you from being able to access your intuition without those biases, without those things holding you back. And so that's what we are talking about today. As a quick review, though, we're going to go back and just list off the things that we already know about intuition that we've already discussed so that we can make it back to the spot where we are right now. We have defined intuition, which is valuable to get us on the same page as to what intuition actually is, bringing it here to earth rather than an intangible idea. I have told you how it's shown up for me personally with a beautiful story about um, saying goodbye to my grandmother. We've learned that awareness is kind of the first step of intuition. We have to be aware that it's a possibility and we have to be aware of our body, our mind, our spirit and our environment in order to tune in to our intuition. Then we went into some action steps as to how you could start implementing and tuning in. That was a much more action-oriented podcast. And I ended the last podcast talking about how intention and intuition make magic happen. Intention by itself is great. Intuition by itself is great. And when we use them together, then magic happens. And this podcast, when I was preparing for it, I went in and looked up the definition of intention because we started off with intuition's definition. I thought maybe we should start off with the definition of intention. The very first definition that showed up for intention is the one that you would expect. It is a thing intended, an aim or a plan. It's uh, it's putting meaning or purpose on something. When we use intention and intuition together, essentially what we're doing is we are putting a focus to the information that we're receiving. Intention is a receiving of information. Intention is a focus on that information that we are receiving, which is what makes it so powerful. And we are definitely going to go into ways to put intention in your intuition or ways to use your intuition intentionally, maybe. But when I was looking up the definition, there was another 
definition, a secondary definition that caught my eye and led me down this road today, the subject that we're going to talk about today, which, like I already mentioned, are our blocks. So hang in with me here. We're going to explore this second definition of intention. This definition of intention is kind of under medical terminology. So medically speaking, intention is a way to go about healing and caring for different types of wounds. And there are three different types of intentions. So the very first intention, medically speaking, is to use sutures, whether that's stitches or or maybe um, staples, to be able to close up a wound and assist it in its natural healing. So these wounds are pretty straightforward. They have nice clean edges. They they just happened within a few hours. They're not infected. It's just kind of easy to close up these wounds and just like I said, give them a little boost to help with the natural healing process. So the secondary intention for wound healing is for wounds that cannot be stitched up because of large amounts of tissue loss. They have like really jagged edges and it's just there's there's like glue and stitches are not going to be sufficient in closing up these wounds. And then we have the third intention and this is for wounds that have become infected or are festering or are just not closing up properly. So it's delaying using either the first or second intention because of these infections that are present. Now, the interesting thing about our wounds, and I want to relate these wounds symbolically, these types of wounds symbolically back to our internal wounds, which hold us back. They hold us back because they really shape who we are. We go through many billions of different microseconds of life, and each of those seconds accumulates into who we are today, for better or for worse. And many of those experiences are ones that we experience pain and we create these wounds or we are wounded by others or by our experiences. Now, I'm not going to say that wounds are bad or pain is bad. We have to have these opposite experiences so that the good feels sweeter. We cannot feel satisfaction in our lives unless hard work is accompanied by the payoff. That is just the nature of things. So wounds in and of themselves are definitely not wrong. They are part of us for a really good reason. But when our wounds prevent us from being able to have clarity, prevent us from being able to have a really beautiful perspective on life, when they create deep-seated beliefs that keep us stuck and continue to cause us pain for years and years when when our beliefs and our wounds interrupt our relationships and really start holding us back, that is when we want to kind of address our wounds or what I want to say, dress our wounds, like you would dress some kind of injury. When thinking about how all of these life experiences lead up to who we are today. It kind of makes me think of the movie Slumdog Millionaire. And if you have not seen Slumdog Millionaire, I would highly recommend watching it. It's not a great one to watch with your kids, but it is an Academy Award winning film that is just awesome. (laughs) Go and take some time to watch it. But I'm going to tell you a little bit of the premise of some dog millionaire. Don't worry, I won't give anything away. The movie begins with a guy who is on the game show Who Wants to Be a Millionaire hosted in India. 
And it's leading up to the very last question, the question where he wins the game. And everybody's ecstatic because he's there. Everybody's hanging on the edge of their seats to see if he can get this one last question. And they go to commercial break and he's brought backstage and essentially beaten by the police and then interrogated because they believe that he has cheated and they want to know how he has cheated. And the whole movie progresses as flashbacks to his entire life that back up and gave him the answers to all of the questions on the game show. So they just happened to be questions that he knew the answers to because of his experiences. His experiences that he had throughout his life culminated into the wisdom that he had now. I have experiences, me personally, I have experiences with all of these kinds of wounds that we're going to talk about today. And I know that you have experience with all of these kinds of wounds. And I've been very fortunate enough to be able to make it to the other side of these wounds and be able to look back on them and be able to see how it was that I came out on the other side better than I was before. The very first intention and wound type is the one that is a surface level wound, one that's relatively straightforward. It's happened recently. It's fairly easy to close up with a few sutures. Let's flash back to a time when I was newly pregnant with my daughter, my second daughter, and my brother invited me to go to a conference. This conference is one that really teaches a whole bunch of tools that are like like what I'm teaching you now, tools to be able to improve your life at at a simple statement. It was run by three key elements with Kirk Duncan. And there was a mastermind class where he was teaching affirmations. If you don't know what an affirmation is, it's essentially a positive statement that you say out loud um, again and again and again until you kind of rewire your brain to be able to think in a new way. So it's often basically the opposite of your negative beliefs that you have about yourself. You're going to write something the opposite, positive, and repeat those again and again. The concept behind it is, is that your brain is going to look for evidence of the things that you say most in your mind, that internal talk. And so if you're always like, I am stupid, why am I so stupid? I'm always stupid. I'm the stupidest one in the room. Your brain is going to then look for all of the evidence that you are stupid and it's going to back it up. If our internal dialogue changes, even when it's forced to something more positive, like I'm very intelligent. I'm wise. How is it that I know the answer to all of the questions? Maybe not at the moment, but I can find the answer. I'm very resourceful. When we start having that positive talk again and again in our mind, then our brain starts to back it up by finding examples and logging them away that, yes, this statement is true. And it can take time, but over time, you're rewiring your brain, rewriting your internal stories that you have about yourself to produce a different outcome. So we're in this great big conference room and there's Kirk Duncan up on the stage and he's teaching us this these concepts about using affirmations and how they can change your life. He has people from the audience come up and volunteer to make up some powerful affirmations there in front of everyone. And, you know, they they take a minute to talk about some of the struggles that they have in their life, those negative beliefs, and then they take a minute to um, rework them and bring out a positive affirmation for them. And we got to see this all live in real time. Somebody trying to figure this out and Kirk helped them walk through it. 
So they're up on stage. They have their newly written positive affirmations. And one by one, he has them state their affirmation. So let's go back. Maybe one of them was their negative belief was, I am stupid. (laughs) And they switched it to, I am wise and intelligent. And so they'd get up there and they'd be like, okay, I am wise and intelligent. And Kirk would be encouraging them to say it louder, more forceful. So they try again. I am wise and intelligent. And then he would teach them about their body language. Let let me see it in your body language. Come on, make me believe this. And they would roll their shoulders back and they would throw their hands to the side and, and they would start saying, I am wise and intelligent. And then by the end of it, he had them yelling with confidence, full stature, everything showing that they believed in this statement. I am wise and I am intelligent. And you could clearly see the difference from when they began to where they ended. You could tell that there was a shift inside of them that allowed them to believe if only for a minute, that there was the possibility that they were not stupid, but that they were actually wise and intelligent. And he encouraged each person to go home, write a list of affirmations, and practice these affirmations in the mirror. I went home and I'm pretty sure I didn't even think twice about it. I was like, that's a cool skill. I'll do it in a minute. And then never came back to it. Well, time went on. I was pregnant with my second daughter and the pregnancy began to be really difficult for me. I get the, a condition called preeclampsia with every single one of my pregnancies. This condition is very common with your first pregnancy, but most people do not have this condition continue on with the rest of their pregnancies. I just hit the jackpot with the genes, I guessed, and I have a tendency to get preeclampsia with my pregnancies. Preeclampsia can be extremely dangerous to you and the baby and can actually result in in death if it goes untreated. So this pregnancy was just as hard as the first. I had preeclampsia and one of the very lovely side effects with preeclampsia is that you have a tendency to gain weight very rapidly and this is due to water retention. So it's not necessarily like you're packing on the pounds, but you are holding on to all of your water weight. And so you stretch and you get big and you have like stretch marks that are going to last an eternity. They're never coming back. Your skin will never be the same. And your face gets round. And, you know, like, have you ever seen somebody who's just retaining a lot of water, maybe because they're sick or they went on a hike, whatever it is, they just have that roundness in their face and their cheeks. And this was hard. This was really hard for me. I'm not scared to admit it that I am probably like the majority of people and I'm really self-conscious. And I would look at these amazingly cute and skinny, gorgeous pregnant women and (laughs) obviously not feel like I looked like them. With my history in, in personal training, I wanted to go to the gym and I wanted to work it off and wanted to do everything I could do to stop it from happening. But That's the other part of preeclampsia is that you cannot raise your blood pressure. So working out is not an option for you. You're kind of just stuck in this place where you are going to continue gaining weight, continue having headaches, continue having this risk until you deliver your baby. And I kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually I really hated the way that I looked. Hated it so much that I just stopped looking in the mirror. Because every time I looked in the mirror, it was unbearable (laughs) 
to see myself like that. And it continued to really affect me to the point where there was no way that I was going to get naked in front of somebody. <laughs> and there was no way that I wanted Andrew to touch me because I just felt so gross. I felt so unattractive. I felt so ugly. I stopped looking at myself in the mirror. My daily thoughts were, why am I so fat and ugly? I can't wait for this baby to be out of me so that I can not be so fat and ugly. And then you're racked with guilt and shame because you know that this is a wonderful human child and, and I should be so grateful for this opportunity to bring her into my life. And all I could do was just be totally consumed by these thoughts of me being so ugly. And I got so depressed and life was bleak and awful. <laughs> it sounds silly. It sounds ridiculous. But honestly, it was. It was for me at that time in my life. With preeclampsia, you have very frequent doctor appointments because they need to keep an eye on, one, your blood pressure and also the protein in your urine. So you go in to the doctor's office and every single time you get a pee in one of those clear cups with the blue lids. And it gets to the point where everybody knows your name. You walk in, they're like, hey, Laura, you just grab the cup and you just know what you're doing. No explanation on how to do it needed. You've done it before. So it was another check. And I went into the doctor's office, grabbed the cup, walked into the bathroom, made sure to not look at myself in the mirror as I passed it, sat down, did the deed, and then went over to wash my hands like you should do after using the bathroom, but especially after giving a urine sample. <laughs> I was washing my hands in the sink and very adamant in not looking at myself in the mirror because of this disdain that I had for myself. But over in the corner of the mirror, I noticed a sign. And I thought, well, I mean, I can look at the sign. So I looked up at the sign, expecting it totally to be this infographic or something. And instead, it had three words on it. All it said was, you are beautiful. And it was as if those words shot me back 10 feet. I? Me? Uh, me. And I would look around the bathroom, like expecting somebody else to be out there that the, the sign was clearly talking to. It wasn't talking to me. And I looked at it again. You are beautiful. Oh, I hadn't heard those words in so long. At least internally. I think Andrew probably said them every single day. But because of the beliefs that I had about myself, they did not absorb. And those words weren't coming out of me at all. And I looked at it again, and I read it again. You are beautiful. And I thought for a second, could I be? Could I be beautiful? I finished up with the doctor's appointment and left realizing that there was power in those words. I remembered Kirk Duncan's class and the affirmation lesson. And I thought, maybe this actually works. Maybe when you say positive things about yourself, you can heal some of these negative beliefs about yourself. I went home and immediately grabbed a piece of paper and just simply wrote down three words. But this time, I changed it to, I am beautiful. And I hung it up on my mirror. And each time I went to wash my hands, not only did I look at myself, but I repeated the words, I am beautiful to myself. Again and again and again, each day saying, I am beautiful. And you know what? It was like the people who went up on stage. At first, it was timid, and I didn't really believe it, even though I wanted to believe it. And it sounded something like, 
I am beautiful. Just kind of this forceful exit of a belief that I wanted to be true. I am beautiful. After time, and with much repetition, I was able to stand in the full body mirror in our room and look at myself, look into my own eyes, and I was able to proclaim, I am beautiful. Nothing had changed with me. My body had not changed. I had not delivered my child. The only thing that changed was my belief about myself. And I was able to heal this belief about myself because of a tool, a powerful tool of affirmations. I was able to stitch up my wounds and allow them to heal naturally with the assistance of some sutures in the form of affirmations. So when you have a wound like this, one that you can clearly see, it's quite visible, it's pretty straightforward, you can identify it, you can put a name to it. Things like affirmations can help you in your natural healing. We get wounds like this all the time. They're inevitable, they will happen. And you can kind of think of your healing techniques as daily maintenance to the wounds that you are going to come across. It's really found in daily habits. Um, Affirmations are not the only ones. And we've talked about some of these tools, these maintenance tools, these sutures, frequently, like spending time outside, journaling, community, affirmations, talking about it, having a safe space, self-love, all kinds of things. And affirmations are just one of these sutures. So think about these wounds that you have. Do I have an intention number one classified wound? What are the tools that I have at my disposal to suture this up? I invite you to use affirmations as one of these things to help with your wounds. But there are wounds that are not as straightforward. And sometimes we're just covering up a a deeper wound. But we'll get to that in a minute. Our second wound type is the one where there has been a lot of tissue loss, where the edges are jagged and raw, and it really doesn't make sense to pull that tissue together. It wouldn't work. These wounds are wounds that come with great loss, wounds that come with the loss of a person, that come with the loss of the job that you wanted, come with the loss of the life that you always thought you would have, These wounds are not straightforward. And in getting them, you feel as though you have lost a piece of yourself, especially when that comes in the form of a person. I had not known great loss up until a couple years ago. I had never had to say goodbye to anybody that I was really close to, except for grandparents. And grandparents, you kind of have a peace with losing them because because they're meant to die. I mean, you know, when we get older, it's much more accepted to allow people to pass on and and be gone from our lives, at least for a time. We can we still have that loss, but it's not quite as severe, or at least it hasn't been for me in my past. But two years ago, I experienced a blow. And this blow came in the form of losing Andrew's mom, my husband's mom, my kid's grandmother. When Kathleen was first diagnosed with colon cancer, she was in Mexico, um, serving as mission presidents in Mexico City with her husband, Todd. And they had to end their time on their mission early and come back in order to receive proper treatment for her cancer. And they went into full-blown cancer treatment mode, did all the things in order to fight it, because when you're diagnosed with stage four colon cancer, you don't just hope for the best. You've got to attack this thing if you want any hope of living. And she did. 
And she did it valiantly and beautifully, so much so that the cancer was gone from her body. Even then, after she had received the news that the cancer was gone, she said, you know, I'm not going to live to be an old grandma. And she took us to, do I have to cry every time (laughs) in these podcasts? I don't know. She took me and my sister-in-law and all of the granddaughters to Disneyland. And she would say things like, I just got to soak up this time. I got to make the most of this time with my kids and my grandkids. And I just didn't believe her. I was like, what do you mean? You're definitely going to be an old grandma. It's You've got forever to live. And she would reiterate, like, I'm not going to be here forever. And sure enough, a couple years later, she had a checkup scan and they had found that the cancer had come back. And like most of the time when colon cancer comes back, it comes back with a vengeance. And it had spread to her lungs and all throughout her colon and in various parts of her body. Your percentage of survival rate goes significantly down when the cancer returns. And I think all of us kind of began to understand that we might be saying goodbye to her sooner than we had anticipated. She fought for a while with chemotherapy and other modalities and eventually decided that she wanted to just live as high of a quality of life with the time that she had left. Her time was short very short, way too short. And we were faced with continuing on a future that no longer had her in it. This was the first time that I really experienced significant loss. I had a second intention wound that couldn't just be healed up by sutures. Nobody could come and just cleanly put my wound back together. The only thing that could heal it was time. These kinds of wounds take time. And there's not always a straightforward answer to healing them. And this is the most frustrating kind of wound for me as somebody who just wants to take charge. Let me just plow through this. There's got to be something that I can put on this wound in order for it to heal faster, right? And I still have a problem with this. I still have experiences, one just very recently, where a friend shared with me her grief and her loss of the life that she once once had and the life that she expected to have and I immediately wanted to, well, we could, we could do this and, and we could do that. And I wanted to fix the wound. But these wounds can't just be fixed like that. They take time to heal. These wounds will eventually, with time, heal. But there will always be a scar. And I don't know if you've ever seen this kind of scar from a wound that has immense tissue loss. But man, they're, they're rough scars. <laughs> they're intense scars. And they are noticeable and they will be part of you forever. You will always remember that loss. Although the pain, I think, eventually starts softening. That initial wound gets scabbed over and eventually scarred over. And so when you bump up against something that might hurt it, It's not quite as painful as it was the year before. Moving on to our third type of intention for a wound that may have been already attempted to be stitched up, but became infected. Or maybe it was a wound that was never attended to and festered. These are wounds that I think come mostly from childhood. 
These are the wounds where we didn't have the skills to be able to clean things up, put antibiotic on it, bandage it, maybe go to the doctor and and get some stitches. We didn't have those tools in our tool belt. We didn't know how to express ourselves emotionally, or we didn't have a safe place to express ourselves. So these wounds never healed up quite right. They have been a part of us for a long time, and they are festering, and they're infected, and they need to be cleaned out. These wounds are gross. Have you ever seen a wound like this? When we were in Hawaii, I don't even remember how many years ago now, but quite a few years ago, I was visiting Hawaii with my husband, my brother, sister-in-law, and my parents. And we were exploring the ocean's edge on some tide pools. And this specific tide pool was so beautiful because the rocks created these really um, deep pools. And so we were kind of hopping from rock to rock, looking at all of these little creatures. And suddenly I hear a splash, a huge splash. And I look around and I see my mom in the water and like totally fully submerged. And she comes up <gasps> gasping for air. And my first thought was to laugh a little bit because, oh my gosh, you fell in the water. How silly. Now you're all wet. We'll have to go back to the hotel and change our clothes. And it was in just an instant later that I knew something was wrong. She had this pure look of shock on her face. And she lifted her leg out of the water so we could see. And her foot was literally dangling by just a piece of skin onto her leg. Intensely terrifying. Intensely traumatic. We rushed her to the hospital where they took her into immediate surgery. But the thing with this wound is this wound was a open wound. The muscles, the bones, and everything were exposed. But because of the slipperiness of the rocks and because of the weight of my mom, we did not feel comfortable or confident getting her out of the water safely. So we held her head there and we talked her through deep breaths until the ambulance came. But that entire time, her leg was exposed to salt water. Gross, bacteria-filled, sewage-filled salt water. And in that time that it was exposed, it took on massive amounts of bugs and nastiness. And the doctor told us, we're going to put her leg back on. We're going to see if we can can do that. But I want you to be aware that there is a chance that she'll lose her leg because of a huge chance of great infection. Those were the most horrifying hours of my life as she went into surgery and we waited to hear news and then found a bit of relief when my dad called and told me that the surgery had been successful, that she, that they had attached her foot back onto her leg, and that it would take time to heal. And this time would be excruciating, that she would have to literally keep her toes above her nose, and that they would have to monitor her very closely to watch the inevitable infection. She had to stay there in Hawaii and could not come back because of an infection that spread through her leg. And they would have to do uh, procedures to clean out the infection as best as they could. They would have to reopen these wounds, clean them out with sterile water, and then close them back up so that they could then have a fighting chance of overcoming these infections. That, my friend, is definitely a third intention classified wound. A wound that was closed up, but was harboring germs to cause infection. 
or it's a wound that is so great that it can't help but to be exposed to pathogens. No matter what you do to try and save it, it it's going to be exposed. And these wounds are incredibly difficult to come through. We are so hurt by these wounds that we'll even get to the point where we will deny them. We will hide them away from our very selves to the point where we don't even know they exist anymore because we have shoved them so deep down and we have ignored their infection for so long that we just don't even recognize that they're there. In type one intention, the wound is very fresh. It's open, exposed. We can see it clearly. But in type three wounds, I think that these are wounds that have been there and been part of us for so long that we almost don't even recognize that they are there anymore. But just because we don't consciously see them, just because we're not hyper aware of them, absolutely does not mean that they are not affecting our every second of life. When you have a severely infected ankle that when you just had your foot pop off of your leg and it's infected and it's taking a long time to heal, but you're not attending to that infection and you're kind of just ignoring that it's there. Every step is excruciating. The way that you walk, the way that you act, the activities that you can do are completely altered because of this wound. And that is exactly how it shows up in our life. When we do not treat our massive wounds that we've hidden away from ourselves, they affect our day-to-day, how we treat others, how we treat ourselves, what activities we will or will not do, our perspective on life. And sometimes when we have these wounds, if we heal through them appropriately, all of those experiences and all of those um, perspectives can actually help us and aid us to have empathy and compassion and more abounding love. But when we do not heal these things and we don't attend to them, then it just results in a continual woundedness. And our woundedness shows up every day. And you may not be able to see it, but sometimes those around you can see it better than you can see it. So how do we attend to these wounds, these deep, festering, infectious wounds? The only way is to acknowledge that they're there, that you have a problem, see that your foot is falling off of your leg, (laughs) and then also to open it back up. Some of these wounds have been here for a long time and they have tried to heal naturally, but we haven't done our due diligence in cleaning it out, filling it with antibacterial ointment and making sure that it has the best bet of healing. So sometimes we have to go in, open up the wound and clean it out. It's only recently that I think I've been able to do this, to open up a wound and to clean it out and to give it time to heal back. Um, But I'm super grateful for the things that have come into my life to allow me to be able to do this. But most people are not ready or not willing to go in and reopen their wounds. That sounds ridiculously painful. How are you supposed to do that? And in answer to that, I would suggest that you can't do it alone. You don't want to go and take the scalpel to yourself. And you need the assistance of a doctor or some guide, somebody to help you to go in, recognize these wounds, open them up and clean them out. That for me personally has come in the form of therapy. I've had deep, intense wounds come up, especially over the last year, where eventually I got to the point where I knew that I wasn't going to be able to work through these things by myself, that I needed outside help. I need somebody to come over and assist me in my wound healing, and that was through therapy. I've done a number of different kinds of therapies, and there are so many options out there for for you, and you're not always going to find 
the right kind of therapy or modality at first, but I feel absolutely confident that there is something that's going to work for you. There's EMDR, which is a fantastic way of of tricking your brain with eye movement to be able to go in and heal from trauma. There's just your typical therapy where you're having space to be able to process and just verbalize yourself. There's even ketamine therapy, which has really made a significant difference in a number of people's lives that I know personally. One technique that I've used recently that has been mind-blowingly productive is from a book called Mind Change. I would highly recommend looking up those this book and this type of therapy and emotionally emotional processing. It's essentially you go and you look at the initial wounded time, if you can identify it. Sometimes it's really hard to identify, but you go back to that moment when you felt that wound and then the wound continues to then shape the rest of your life and your perspective. Well, you can go into that moment. You put yourself into that moment and then through a series of of different techniques and tools, you then put yourself into a place of peace, a place of relaxation, and go back into that memory and literally rewrite the memory. Just what we've been talking about of rewriting our stories, there are tools and modalities to go back and rewrite these stories to be able to come out on the other side as an adult version of Lara and and be able to heal that childhood self with a perspective that I did not have the capacity to see at that time. So this third intention type wound, I think you need external help. It's childhood wounds. It's wounds that have festered for a really long time and need to be identified, opened up, and cleaned out before they can heal properly. But the amazing thing is, is that this is totally possible. It's in, it's it, it sounds crazy, but it is absolutely possible for you to be able to do this. And the person that you are on the other side of healing these wounds is like the person that you always knew was there. The person that really has always wanted to come out and shine, but hasn't been able to because you've been limping your entire life. That's the kind of result that comes from healing these wounds. When we take the time to identify and heal any number of these wounds, whether it's superficial, whether it's from large tissue loss, or whether it's infected, when we take the time to do this and clear our perspective, biases, and beliefs, then all of a sudden we are in a place that is much more open to seeing the world through an, uh, the lens of beauty. And we can use intuition to lead us and guide us because we're not getting hung up on the beliefs of our past, which will influence it, everything. So I really encourage you to take the time to identify these wounds. Use this as a guide. What do I need? Can I just use day-to-day habits and, and new reframing of my mind to do this? Do I need time and space? Do I need to go through the grieving process? Or do I need help and assistance with major childhood trauma and I need to evaluate, open them up, and be able to clean them out? Ask yourself what these wounds are going to take to be able to heal and then take a step towards healing them. Who I am today, I think, is a pretty solid version of myself that has a pretty good shot at winning my own symbolic version of who wants to be a millionaire. I'm not perfect by any means, and I think we've already established that. But I do have tools in my pocket to be able to go back to these experiences and these wounds and be able to rewrite them so that I can see them with perspective and I can embrace more love, light, and happiness in my life. And I'm really grateful for that. I'm grateful for all of my experiences with my wounds 
but I'm also grateful for the knowledge that I have today that has helped me to overcome those wounds to be a better version of myself. That is it for today. And hopefully next time we've got maybe a little bit of a lighter episode for you. But nonetheless, those things need to be addressed. And it is something that is vitally important to us being able to use our intuition. Maybe the first step to using your intuition is addressing your wounds, I guess, after acknowledgement, awareness, and knowing what intuition is. This next step of healing your wounds is is so important. So I will talk to you next time on the Soul Script Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me on this transformative journey today. If you found this episode inspiring and thought-provoking, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and share with someone in your life who's ready to embrace their own hero's journey. Speaking of transformation, if you're looking for personalized guidance, to rewrite your life's narrative and ignite your true potential, be sure to explore our one-on-one transformation coaching services at soulscriptstudio.com. Your support makes a world of difference. Until next time, keep rewriting and reigniting your story.